President Trump appears to be welcoming the Kremlin back into the Oval Office in the quote unquote not too distant future. The White House confirms President Trump and Putin discussed the possibility of a meeting at the White House during that uh, congratulatory phone call uh, when, uh, of course, Putin was reelected and uh, Trump congratulated him. This happening despite Putin meddling in. Uh, his own election, interfering with the U.S. Uh, 2016 election, actively targeting the current midterm election, and despite allegedly trying to kill a former Russian spy with a dangerous nerve agent. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders issued this statement, uh, quote, as the president himself confirmed on March 20th, hours after his last call with President Putin, the two had discussed a bilateral meeting in the not-too-distant future at a number of potential venues, including the White House. We have nothing further to add at this time. With me now, CNN's Fareed Zakaria, host of Fareed Zakaria GPS. And we should point out, too, it was the Kremlin who actually broke the news first and then the White House following up, which seems to be a theme that they're getting their information before we are. That said, yeah. what would a Trump Putin Washington summit even look like? Well, it would be a big media event, and I think Donald Trump is not uh, is not insensitive to that reality. I think he knows that it would be a huge media event. It would be, you know, uh, covered all over the world. Look, I think they should meet. The, you know, the president of the United States should meet the leader of Russia. The issue, At the White House? Well, I don't think it matters where. I okay. think the issue is what, he, what, it, what they talk about. I think the most important thing is that at the meeting, the issues you raise should be raised front and center, which is that the first thing we have to talk about, Mr. Putin, is your interference in the American election, Western elections, the French election, the German election, Brexit. Uh, here's the here's the evidence. Here's you know, and here's why it has to stop, and here's what we will do, and here's what it would cost you if it doesn't stop. That seems to me to be, you know, you've got to get past that before you can then go, get on to discuss modalities of of you know what kind of ceasefire you want in Syria and what kind of transition to a different kind of government. I mean, those are all important issues, but here you've got the ma the giant elephant in the room is that the Russians have been engaged in this hybrid war. They call it, that's their phrase, a hybrid war against the West. And we don't really talk about it. You mentioned Syria for a second, and, you know, a lot of his own senior aides in the Pentagon were like, what the what, when he made that comment at that speech in, in Ohio the end of last week, saying that the U.S. would withdraw very shortly. What did you make of that when you saw that? <sighs> you that was know, a sigh. I, I think that I have come to realize that with President Trump, you know, as I wrote last week, words are weightless. They really, they mean nothing. Uh, it means that that day he, he, you know, he got briefed on something or he came up with, a, with an idea. You have to wait to see if those get followed up with actions, whether other administration officials affirm that. Because otherwise, it, it, it means nothing. I mean, you know, I mean, this is a man who said okay. 150 times that we would build a wall and Mexico would pay for it within the first year of his administration to China. The fact that China is slapping revenge tariffs on the U.S. and saying more are coming. Is this the beginning of a trade war? I had a guest a few minutes ago saying it's the opening salvo. How do you read it? Well, it's a bad idea. It's very important to remember. It's a bad idea for the American economy outside of anything else because when you start putting taxes and tariffs are just taxes on imported steel, it's important to remember there are many, many more jobs at stake for companies, American companies that use imported steel, whose costs have now gone up. In fact, there's the math on this is clear. It's, I think it's about five times as many Americans are employed by industries that use imported steel and therefore for whom the costs go up than steel companies that export the steel and for whom this, you know, this is presumably an, an advantage. So it's a bad idea for the American economy. Also, as you, the second issue is, other countries aren't going to take it lying down. And by the way, we're in a much more competitive world, a much more multipolar world with regard to all this stuff. The Chinese import vast quantities of goods from the United States. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that the Chinese have been so ruthlessly political and strategic in, their, in what they announced. All the areas they chose were areas where the people involved and affected are non-urban non-college educated. In other words, this is largely Trump voters. And so they've gone exactly for the people who would politically be most likely uh, to, to, you know, to, to be upset, and then the administration is going to be likely to worry about it. Uh, if, if the, you know, this is the problem with these trade wars. 
Is the administration going to now take this lying down? Is it going to say, okay, the Chinese have just slapped a whole bunch of tariffs, we're not going to do anything? Mm. Then it'll stop. Mm. Generally, that's not what happens. Generally, the administration will feel, well, we have to do something to retaliate against those tariffs, and then the Chinese will, and the Chinese have made it clear, yeah, this is our first set. We can keep going up as well. Fred Zakaria, thank you so much.